privilege has been on my mind as of late. Certainly it did not miss our notice last week as we heard the verdict from the George, George Floyd murder case last week. There was a modicum of relief that one individual would be held accountable for his heinous actions, even if much work remains for us to achieve justice as a society. White privilege, unfortunately, is alive and well, even though Derek Chauvin, a white police officer, was found guilty of murder of a black man. But privilege is associated with more than just the color of one's skin or ethnic origin. There are many levels of privilege within our society. In addition to skin color, I can think of hierarchies of gender based on sexual orientation, our gender, socioeconomic status, religion. In our society, in the United States, white, wealthy, cisgender, Christian, heterosexual men are at the top of the heap and everyone else falls somewhere else. What does privilege mean? Some people chafe at the notion that they've been given more than others. I've worked for what I've earned, they say. Because one has privilege, however, doesn't mean that everything has been handed to them on a silver platter. So what does privilege mean? I think what privilege means is that those who have more privilege than others their mistakes are more easily overlooked or ignored. They're more likely to be given the benefit of the doubt. It's more likely that there will be an assumption that even if they've done something wrong, they will improve in the future. Examples of privilege abound in our society. I can think of a few that come to mind readily. A number of years ago, a Stanford student raped a woman he was a white man, an athlete. People saw in him so much potential and they thought that he should be given a second chance, the privilege to make those assumptions because of his gender and the color of his skin. And let's juxtapose that with the Central Park Five in 1989, when five black and Latinx youth were convicted of a crime of raping and assaulting a white female jogger in Central Park. There was presumed guilt. In fact, our former president convicted them in the court of public opinion before the trial. After serving between six to 13 years in jail, they were later acquitted. They were black and Latinx. They weren't given the benefit of the doubt. It wasn't assumed that they had a promising future ahead of them. They didn't have the privilege that the young man at Stanford who raped a woman had. We can think of privilege when it comes to heinous crimes, but also there's the everyday notion of what privilege means in our society. I'll give you another example, one from our very own community, one that was shared with me by one of our students at Beth Emmett. Shortly after we returned from our civil rights trip, Beth Emmett students and Second Baptist students, where we went down south to visit civil rights sites and talked about issues of privilege and racism in our society. One of our students shared a story with me after they went back to school. She said to me, Rabbi London, let me tell you what happened in class today. As class was ending, there was a black man in my class and he pulled out his phone and he started to use it. And the teacher yelled at him and said, you're not allowed to use that phone in class. That is against the rules. I'm gonna send you to the principal or wherever students go when they're in trouble. And the student of ours from Beth Emmett spoke up and said, excuse me, I've been sitting here all class period with my headphones in and listening, listening to music on my phone and you said nothing to me. Why are you calling out this black boy and you didn't call me out? The teacher gasped, but our student understood what she was saying that she had privilege of being in white skin and that she could get away with things that her black classmate could not. Because of the issue of privilege, it's a reason that in our society that parents of color 
have to have the talk with their children, telling them how they might be treated on the street, how they should interact with police officers for fear that they could be harmed. And again, as I said, their levels of privilege, the talk is not just for people of color, but I think that many of us who have raised girls also have had the talk with our girls about how they might be taken advantage of, how they might be hurt, and things that they should do to protect themselves before they go off into college and out into the greater world. And the talk also happens for kids who are gay, queer, trans, because they could be harmed. And as parents, we want to protect them. But these talks are just stopgap measures to protect vulnerable people. Ultimately, the onus is not on the victim, but on the perpetrators. Ultimately, we need changes in attitudes and behavior, and we need to change our systems that allow these prejudices to flourish and don't bring to account those who are guilty. Our reform movement is at one of those moments of reckoning about privilege. Over the last number of weeks, many stories started to be shared on the Reform Rabbi's Facebook page, mostly from women who are talking about the sexism, abuse, and other things that they experienced in the rabbinate, and in particular while they were students at the Hebrew Union College, the seminary that both Rabbi Memes Fuller and I attended. And in response to these stories that were shared, the Hebrew Union College, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and the Union for Reform Judaism have all hired legal firms and have asked that if people have stories to share about abuse that they experienced in the rabbinate or because of any of these institutions, to call the lawyers and to share those stories. Many of these stories were known before. Some of some people who were found to have been guilty, their hands were slapped and they moved on to the next congregation. But now the movement says that they're serious, that there'll be real investigation and soul searching. And the privilege of having a man who has abused his power in one job will not be allowed just to move on to the next job and the congregation not even know what had happened before. This might sound familiar because, of course, the same thing happened within the Catholic Church, that priests would leave one job, go to another parish, commit the same crimes, and then move on to the next place. Our movement needs to take responsibility for the harm that has been done. The system has to change. It's not just enough to change attitude. We need to start with really holding those who have transgressed boundaries and hurt others accountable and make sure it's not tolerated in the future. If you have not yet seen the movie Promising Young Woman, I highly recommend it. It was nominated for Best Picture of the Year. Promising Young Woman explores how our society perpetuates sexism and the abuse of women. The movie makes a strong statement that not just the abusers are to blame, but our institutions that don't hold them accountable, the bystanders who don't stop them or report them, bystanders of any gender, by the way, and the leaders who give abusers the benefit of the doubt, but not the victims. In order to drive home the point about the culture and systems that need to change to stop the abuse, in the movie, two women and a nice guy are shown to be culpable in the abuse that occurs. If the system is inequitable, if the system doesn't hold abusers to account, it's not enough to be nice to protect people. The system has to change in order to protect those who are most vulnerable. In a sexist system, women can be sexist. In a racist society, Black people can also be racist. Just because you are part of a particular group doesn't mean you won't uphold an unfair system in which people like you suffer. These are some of the many things that this movie explores. And I think that it's important that we all see it and discuss it. After I saw it, I said to my husband, Danny, I said, every student who's about to go off to college must watch this movie and understand the kinds of things that can happen in our society in order to protect women, in order to protect all of us against this kind of abuse. The movie is about sexism, but the lessons apply 
to all our systemic injustices, racism, homophobia, etc. In these weeks, we are marching through reading the book of Leviticus. It's not the most scintillating reading in our Torah. We read about the sacrificial system, arcane laws. As our parsha begins this week, it is about the laws of who can serve as a priest and who a priest can and cannot marry. Much of the book of Leviticus is focused on issues of purity and impurity. How can the book of Leviticus guide us in dealing with the systemic issues of oppression? Leviticus recognizes that the world is messy and chaotic. Order was established when the world was created. God created order from chaos, okay, from chaos, from tohu vavohu, we had seder. But the world is always moving towards entropy, towards disorder. Our task as human beings is to continue what God started, to wrest order out of chaos. How do we do that? Leviticus contains rituals and rules whose purpose is to help us create order. Some make sense for today and the others don't, but the concept, the underlying principles of the book of Leviticus are still applicable. Torah impels us to create order and the fair, just, and dignified treatment of human beings is an essential part of the order that the Torah commands us. We must strive to create order of chaos, wrest justice from injustice, and cultivate righteousness where there is meanness and unfairness. Torah demands we put structures in place to protect and care for everyone, especially the most vulnerable, those who lack privilege, as we might say today. We continue together 